before we get into this week's episode, I want to make a plug for Art Market Minute. This is Artnet News's new micro podcast hosted by Margaret Kerrigan, who's the site's news editor, Europe. It offers a weekly snapshot of essential art market news expertly compiled by the Artnet Pro editorial team. You have a generation of photographers that say, well, we're going to control the image. We're going to control how the image is seen. We're going to control who gets to have access to our images. Hi, I'm Andrew Goldstein, and this is The Art Angle, a podcast from Artnet News where the art world meets the real world, bringing each week's biggest story down to earth. Now that we're all a few weeks into the coronavirus crisis, a new normal is beginning to emerge. And surprise, surprise, it involves a lot of screen time. You wake up, check your phone for the latest news and social media posts, log onto your laptop to start working remotely, throw on a shirt to begin your punishing battery of Zoom meetings, and then log off at the end of the day to pour a glass of wine and finally decompress, probably in front of yet another screen. Over the course of this routine, you may not realize it, but you've been consuming hundreds, if not thousands of images by photographers, both amateur and professional. Photography, along with video, has become our primary way of engaging with the world. This has been particularly salient in the fields of fashion and art photography, where the people who are getting the biggest opportunities, both behind and in front of the camera, are more diverse than ever. One person who has been following this phenomenon particularly closely is the art critic and curator Antoine Sargent, whose recent book from Aperture, titled The New Black Vanguard, lays out a convincing case that a group of young black photographers are bringing about an explosion of creativity in the liminal space where art and fashion meet. Today, to talk about that book and what this current moment means for the world of photography, I'm very pleased to have Antoine on the podcast. Thanks very much for coming on The Art Angle, Antoine. Thanks for having me. I'm really excited about being here and talking about photography and the new normal. So speaking of the new normal, where are you bunkered down to ride out these strange days? I'm in Brooklyn. I, I'm in my apartment in downtown Brooklyn, and I've been here, I guess, for the last five weeks, you know, <laughs> trying to figure out what my new routine is as we try to get to a place where people are safe again and we can have contact with friends, loved ones, art and artists. So you published your book before this whole crisis hit. And I want to talk about your book, but before that, Let's go even further back in time. Can you tell us a little bit about your own backstory? How, how did you first become drawn to working with art? It actually all started in the city. The short, abridged version is I grew up in Chicago, and I was very fascinated by politics. And that led me to study in the School of Foreign Service at Georgetown, where I interned for Hillary Clinton. I interned for, you know, some Democratic politicians and the White House Conference on Renewable Energy. And by the end of it, I was you know, pretty kind of exhausted by Washington. And I wanted to do something else. And, and at Georgetown, service was just a very big part of student life there. And so I decided that I would move to New York and do Teach for America. I mean, I did that for four years. But while I was doing that, I met my really good friend, Jaja Fay, who is a director of digital at the Jewish Museum. And she was at that time at um, the Guggenheim leading digital projects. And she would just like take me to art stuff, you know. And from there, we just kind of fell in with an emerging group of artists, you know, from Jordan Castile to A. Walariscu to Jennifer Packer and Eric Mack and this group of artists who were finishing grad school. And that led to becoming friends with other artists and just organically becoming a part of what we call the New York art world. And I remember going to Brook Museum 2012, I think it was, seeing Mickling Thomas's first major survey and, and felt this profound curiosity and wanting to know more. And so... I had to figure out a reason why I wanted to know more. And I was like, maybe I'll write about art. And so I just started to pitch stories and to think about artists who are not having their voices out there, but also wanting to write about, you know, my generation very, very early in their careers. And so a lot of the artists that I kind of came up with, so to speak, 
I was the first person to write about their work in the press in some of the cases and just, you know, stay with it over the years. And that's kind of how it all began. I grew up going to museums and as a kid in, in school. And so arts were very much reinforced in my life, but I don't, I never thought of it as a career until I was in New York. And I mean, that was almost 10 years ago now. Wow. I mean, it's so interesting that you come from the, the political sphere working with Hillary Clinton. So not, I don't want to say I was working. I was definitely like an intern in every capacity. I think that early education informs definitely my perspective. The things that I'm, I'm interested in, in terms of art, in terms of the stakes in which artists appeal to the world and how the framing of that happens in my writing or my curatorial stuff, I think is very much around the politics of power and race and the, the kind of daily politics that we're all negotiating. I mean, I, you seem to have hit a, a very fertile and important moment in the culture where there was all of a sudden the opening of a lot of doors that were previously shut to artists of color, to women artists, to basically your non-white male artist population, which numbers you know, far more than your white male population. But it's not even a renaissance because it hasn't really happened before. And some of the artists that you mentioned that you were coming up with, like Awal Aruzku, started getting these huge opportunities. Like in 2017, I think a lot of people first encountered him when Beyonce Knowles uh, chose him to take her pregnancy reveal photograph that she posted on Instagram. And this is an instantly iconic photograph. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about how you started to see a movement developing, how you started to see uh, the strands coming together that became the new Black Vanguard? In terms of focusing on your new Black Vanguard and this movement scene, it was in people's studios, but I also was seeing it online, right? When you, you mentioned AWOL and Beyonce, those images that were taken, which were just, again, instantly iconic. You, you, I remember that Halloween, everyone's dressed up as her, you know, from that AWOL shoot. And she didn't choose to use a traditional outlet for those images, right? Traditionally, you do those type of maternity images on the cover of Vanity Fair, or you do them in Vogue, or you do it in this mainstream magazine, right? She chose to publish those images on her Instagram, which was a relatively new platform. And she chose a relatively unknown Black photographer to take those images. That moment of a Black photographer, a Black subject, coming together to create a world that really spoke to the history of art, right? But also spoke to a deep kind of cultural specificity. You have just a generation that says, we're going to take control of not only the creation, but the dissemination of our images. And we're going to decide on who's going to be in these images. We're going to decide on um, the lighting, the mood, the fashion, all of those things. And cutting out people like curators, people like editors to kind of really create exactly what they want the culture to see. And so... I had always been really fascinated by that. And it was something that seemed different about my generation. If you think about previous generations, right? Um, Renee Cox, Rode Carava, even back to someone like James Van Der Zee. What they were kind of preoccupied with, you know, and this is not just in photography, but just in terms of artists. The preoccupation was trying to get inside the institution that had long denied Black creative, you know, production, right? So that's getting inside the museum, that's getting inside the magazine. I mean, that, that's getting your work into these kind of mainstream institutions. And I think that with my generation, what you see is, you know, photographers questioning the validity of those institutions if they're not going to be places where you get to experience a diversity of perspective on photography, on art, on who gets to create those exhibitions or who gets to make those magazines. This was a pretty, in some ways, obvious, at least to me, shift that had happened in photography. And it, it coincides and probably would not be possible without the advent of Tumblr and Instagram and Twitter and social media where you have a culture um, simultaneously becoming more comfortable with their own documentation and becoming obsessed 
with creating their own forms of representation before a camera. Then you have a generation of photographers that say, well, we're going to control the image. We're going to control how the image is seen. We're going to control who gets to have access to our images. I think all of those things are, although they seem desperate, I think they're connected. I I just want to go back to Beyonce. So in 2018, Tyler Mitchell became the first Black photographer ever to shoot the cover of Vogue with Beyonce as the model. And this moment seems to have crystallized something for you where this combination of fashion photography and art became the place where things were happening. Why is that? Well, simply because the image was being consumed not in the traditional way that a fashion photograph is consumed. This was not about the selling of, say, the McQueen dress you know, on the cover. This was about using things like symbolism and photography to really say something about a shift in culture. You know, there were two covers, right? And there's this kind of vulnerability in those images. Tyler Mitchell, this you know young image maker, he was thinking about utopia, right? And how to achieve that through an honest gaze, how to kind of think about Black domesticity and these kind of spaces of safety in the South, where he comes from. And so he's thinking about all these things in the kind of creation, the composition of this image, which is, again, part of the concerns of what we've called art photography. And then when you get to the image where she's wearing the tiered McQueen dress, where you have the colors, the red, the green, the black, the yellow, which is the Pan-African flag of solidarity, right? Which was, again, about communicating empowerment. It It was about thinking beyond the traditional rap that fashion photos get, being superficial, surface driven, et cetera. And then there's a nod there to people like Gordon Parks with the clothesline and to black motherhood. It's like a very clear representation of those histories of black portraiture. You're thinking about, you know, how fashion has been so important and integral to Black image makers, right? But then there's another layer. And then the other layer is this history of discrimination that kept a Black artist outside of museums and Black families out of museums. And so you have, you know, in the Black homes, you have these framed images, right, that are taken by the local photographer and framed by your parents and grandparents as kind of these, you know, informal galleries. Let me drill down there because you you subtitled your book between art and fashion. Do do you see there being a distinction between fashion photography and, and, you know, quote unquote, fine art photography? I think that our generation has really decided that they're not going to play by those rules. I don't think that distinction really ever existed. It was a way to build a market around photography that I think that it just has intensified and become more obvious today. But I think if you look through the history of photography, you have photographers who've done both. So when you're laying out your argument for the new Black Vanguard, you chose to spotlight 15 artists, all of whom are pretty young in their, in their 20s and 30s, who work in this liminal space between art and fashion photography. How did you um, winnow it down to this group? I mean, it was difficult. So these photographers are from all over the world. And so one of the things that was also important was to show that this wasn't just an American phenomenon. I uh, travel a lot or did you know, be, before this moment. And I would see this in London. I would see this in Lagos. I would see this in South Africa. I was it's like, this was the thing that for some reason, and I haven't really quite drilled down on an absolute reason, but particularly in, you know, in the photo space, this was what young photographers, Black photographers were interested in and occupied by, you know? And it is really a global phenomenon. It's, for me, the parameters were to have as broad as a representation as possible. It was important to show that although these are Black photographers, that it was in no way this monolithic idea. And so I think when you go through the book, from one image maker to the next, they're grappling different realities. The conditions of making are very different. You know, what should also be pointed out that that half the photographers are women. And photography in general is a pretty male-dominated um, medium especially fashion photography, you know, like outside of Annie Leibovitz, I don't know who had 
been able to penetrate the covers of Vogue and Vanity Fair and, you know, kind of our mainstream and porn magazine. But here when you have seven, eight women doing that work, doing that work on the backs of women who came before them. And so I think that it was about the, the, the traditional things of like making sure that everyone had a, their own point of view. And there was that the liminal space that you talk about between art and fashion really came through in the images. For example, you have someone like Ariel Bob Willis, who's really thinking about 20th century painters like Jacob Lawrence in the ways in which she's styling and then shooting her figures. And so she's thinking about this kind of way that Jacob Lawrence played with color, but also this in-between uh, figuration and abstraction. That's one of the sources that she cites. And so again, it's this, you know, for all intents purposes, a photographer who makes commercially driven work, but she's thinking about Jacob Lawrence and conditions in which migration happens to a people. And she's, you know, further thinking about how then do those conditions kind of create these abstract identities, right? And that shows up in Jake Williams' work, his mark making, right? And so how does she kind of recreate that mark making in her images? She does that with bright you know, clothing, right? They kind of also create these color blocks that are not unlike the ones that you see in you know, Lawrence's Great Migration series from 1941. They're really thinking about the traditions of art that inform their concerns. You mentioned the international cast of the artists in your book. And what was interesting to me is that nearly half of them are either African by birth or live in Africa. You know, from Awal uh, Rizku, who is African by heritage, to Nadine Ijewere, who was the first black female photographer to shoot a Vogue cover. So does this mean that photography from Africa is having a moment right now? I mean, I think that there's always been just a you know, long tradition there. Um, you think about someone like Malik Sidibe, someone like James Barnard, you th- you know, you can, we can kind of go and go and go, right? Like in terms of um, the rich history, that post-independence history, right? Emergence of photography. I don't know if it's having a moment. I think that because the art world is just so much more global that we're able to see that the contributions we're no longer willing to ignore, you know, the contributions of young image makers on the continent. We were seeing their work put on equal footing in the West, quite frankly, as other photographers, as other painters, as other conceptual artists. For me, it was a no-brainer to kind of make a book that was international in scope just because that's the art world we I live in. I have been to the continent primarily for art. The opening of Zeitz Mocha, the opening of Kehinde Wiley's Artist Residency, you know, 154 Marrakesh. And so for me, it was just really about honoring the integrity of the work and also just the fact these image makers have a lot to say. Are there any stylistic gestures that unite their work? Is there kind of common language that the artists that you've identified are, are working with? I don't think so. I must say that, like, it was important that there wasn't kind of something that united them. And so you can have someone talking about representation, right? Talking about wanting to show their community, but then you get these widely different images. And so I think there's some social concerns that might bind the work together, but I think the resulting images are so just unlike each other. Like, not only do you have, you know, hundreds and hundreds, you know, not thousands of photographers making work, there are some of them who are thinking in wholly original ways about image making. That's why I wanted to kind of have this diversity of difference. So you published this book. It got tons of acclaim. You were curating exhibitions. You were about to curate a special section in the first ever Paris Photo New York Art Fair. And then all of a sudden, the the coronavirus hit. So what has this period been like for you? So I was going to co-curate this section of Paris Photo in New York. It was the first time the fair was going to take place in New York. Art fairs are not generally the place where you look at overlooked or underrepresented artist. And so we came up with this idea of a project space that would happen in addition to the special section that I was going to do of gallery works. And the project space was invitation, you know, and I had invited several photographers and photo organizations to take over the space to really kind of get at this question of 
how do you use the existing structures of art fairs and galleries and museums and commissions and all of that stuff to kind of help bring in more perspectives. And so I was really most excited about testing that idea, testing that concept in an art fair context, right? Because before this moment, every you know year you got invited to another 10. And so I was thinking you know, if that was going to be a part of um, our reality, how do we use that to kind of keep on advancing a uh, real knocking down of some of the traditional barriers for us to see art. I've, you know, have other projects that are supposed to happen later in the year. And one is a photo project. One of them is a project at Brook Museum. And so, you know, I've been working on that stuff, but I've been mostly using this time to just process, you know, kind of personally what this all means. You know, you go from just like personally, just super busy traveling a lot and just kind of all over the place and to kind of having this moment of eerie serenity, which I haven't had in years. And then also just the heaviness of literally hundreds of thousands of people dying around the world and holding space for that sort of grief, right? And, and not trying to distract from that, but really kind of be present for that, you know, and those who will not make it beyond this moment, which is, you know, just tragic. There's the human cost. There's also the the economic cost. And it's no secret that top photographers have always been drawn to fashion work in large part because the brands and the magazines are willing to pay top dollar and they provide a reliable source of income. And now, of course, luxury brands have their stores closed all over the world. The magazines are seeing their ads dry up. There's a tremendous amount of fighting to just like kind of survive. How is this impacting the really positive and exciting trajectories that you you were writing about in your book? I I mean, I think it's too early to tell. Um, But I do know artists are going to make work regardless. And I do know that from the other night, Tyler did his night at the cinema and brought together all of these artists and all these voices to his computer screen that he shared online. And he screened all these films, right? And he had conversations with artists like Arthur Jaffa, who made a piece especially for Tyler for that night to share with his audience. I think that people are still going to work and I think people are still going to make art. And I think that that they'll keep responding to the conditions. I think it'll be kind of a, a historical way to read the moment if you think that artists who, for the vast majority of the last century, who had a very few resources anyway, who did not have a market anyway, won't keep on producing. I think that's an underestimation of their will. And so I think that's going to continue for sure. I mean, there's a lot of bedroom photography that's being done right now. There's a lot of domestic photography. There's a lot of still lifes that are being made. I mean, what are, what are some of the interesting expressions of photography that you've been seeing around the internet and, and following um, the artists you're interested in? All we have now are pictures, which is to say an approximation of reality. Looking at an empty New York um, at rush hour, looking at the hospital workers, these gorgeous portraits that were published today of hospital workers in Italy, you know, and seeing the kind of human toll in their faces, you know. But then I also think about things like on Instagram, where people are doing these kind of diary in images, where they're doing a combination of self-portraits, re-photographing the images on their TV, to moving images that they're making or that they're finding on the internet to kind of create this montage to memory, but also to who they are from that day or in that moment, how people feel as though the conditions in which they have to show the world how they're dealing with this moment is on a photographic platform, which is Instagram, right? And so that defines you largely to images. And folks tell us how they're doing in images, right? Because it's become this kind of new form of social connection. One thing about this disease is the the fact that those of us who are not hospitalized are in isolation. And then those of us who are unfortunately hospitalized 
are also in isolation, no friends, no family. And so it really is kind of up to us in both of those scenarios to document our experiences. I've just been seeing this really interesting photographic response, you know, even to the point of people going back through their camera rolls to relive a moment, you know, that sentimentality of going back through your camera roll, which is a kind of archive anyway, and finding a moment that you either long for in the future or one that says something about a past that you don't have access to at the moment. I mean, in a, in a very literal way, it allows you to envision a better world without the coronavirus. You know, you also, you mentioned how the photography is our window into the outside world right now. And we're all, you know, doing everything we can to keep this disease as far away from us as possible. But the photographers who are going out there and taking pictures of the hospitals, of the doctors, of the patients, like they, they're on the front lines. I mean, are, yeah. are, are there any photographers who you feel are really capturing this moment or who are doing um, extraordinary work right now? Yes, obviously it's not something that Governor Cuomo or the president going to call an essential service, but we need to be able to remember this moment and how we get to do that is yes, is going to be in terms of the written word and people reflecting that way, but it's also going to be in the images that we get to see. If you think about the new cover of ID magazine, Willie Van Pierre, the fresh photographer, did all of these covers over Zoom of subjects around the world. And, it, and the, the issue of, of ID is called safe and sound, right? It, it really is this interesting take on being able to show the stakes in a photo with this screen grab. Again, that's kind of more in the fashion realm. But I, I mean, I saw this earlier today. There's a photographer in Italy named Andrea Frezzanetti. And, you know, he went around to the hospitals and took close-up portraits of healthcare workers, doctors and and first responders and nurses. It, it just shows a, a really up close and personal portrait of the coronavirus, right? Of our response to it. And so I think that like you have both things happening. You have this credible photojournalism happening where people are risking their lives, but then you also have a still lives, you know? And so I think people are being creative, making the work. That's such a fascinating way of putting it. Because yeah, if we're forced to be more provincial and local in our actual lived experience, can we still be cosmopolitan and global in our creativity? That's going to be a very interesting thing because I'm sure there is going to be a knock-on effect of all of this where international travel is really going to get a hit. Yeah, I think in the short term, you have museums who have started to try to think globally about their collections, started to think globally about the roles they're playing. Some museums have even franchised into other parts of the world. It has been absolutely to our benefit that that sort of exchange has happened, and that sort of exchange has to continue if we are going to continue to push our definitions of art forward. Well, this has been totally fascinating. Thanks a lot for coming on the podcast. That's it for this week's episode of The Art Angle. If you like what you heard, you can subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and SoundCloud. The Art Angle is produced by Tim Schneider and Caroline Goldstein and edited by Nick Long. Thanks for listening and see you next week. <laughs>